Oh, well, thanks for coming to our session. Um, I'm Professor Tyrone Pitsis. I'm Pro Dean here at Leeds University Business School um, and Professor of Strategy in uh, the uh, Strategy Group, obviously. Um, we've got four presentations, including my own. Uh, I'll, I'll be presenting third, but, but first we'll have uh, Professor Chris Panza, who's, who's uh, Professor of Strategy and Innovation uh, within the school. He also uh, runs CTI, which is our research centre uh, specialising in technology and innovation. Um, and, uh, and Chris is going to talk about the, uh, basically the managing the age of disruption. We'll then have Hakan Azat, who, who, who's uh, one of our new uh, wonderful recruits here. and He's a, he's a, he's a, a, a lecturer in, in strategy. Uh, also works uh, on areas of innovation platforms, really exciting area, massive growth area. Uh, you know, some of the biggest challenges uh, for the next 10 or so years are going to be around uh, issues around uh, platform design and, and platform integration. Uh, and then we have from uh, from IB Group, Marud, uh, and he's uh, your senior lecturer. Uh, no. Uh, I've just given you. I've just given you a promotion. There you go. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm proud. I just had the proud in. I'm. I'm a senior lecturer now. Yeah, and and, uh, and we're just going to talk about um, knowledge search, which is really interesting in terms of how how we how we do knowledge search in terms of um, uh, uh, impacting uh, institutional performance. Um, so I I will not talk now because you're going to have to listen to me uh, for 15 minutes later. So straight over to Christo and and thank you a lot for coming. Uh, well, I was, of course, told that not to make this presentation very technical, very kind of management science orientated, although I kind of assume that a lot of people here in the room, there are some of them who are kind of expert in this field, they are, I assume, some students of the, at the business school. Uh, so that kind of changed a little bit how I kind of wanted to start. Uh, but nevertheless, I think that have you been uh, today at a keynote presentation at a, uh, in, in the morning? It was quite interesting that the keynote speaker that introduced smart cities and he was talking about the productivity puzzle here in UK, he said that one of the reasons might be the man management competency. Maybe the UK managers aren't that great. So that's quite interesting because you rarely hear this and somehow this has a relevance to what all four of us are actually doing here because probably a lot of you even if you are a business school students when we talk about things technology and innovation you don't really assume that this should be part of the business school so innovation is usually something that people assume that this is our this is what our engineering and science colleagues are doing and yes there is some commercial awareness around but essentially innovation is, is an engineering problem or is a problem of scientific discovery, but it's not a management problem. Now, of course, policymakers might have a little bit of a different view. They say that innovation has to have some economic impact and they will measure this economic impact, but not many people actually believe that innovation is actually a management and organizational challenge. And I, thi I think that what all four of us will talk today is is about innovation being essentially an organizational and management challenge and not just an engineering challenge, scientific challenge, or challenge of m measuring some economic performance. Uh, of course, I will talk a little bit about uh, what is disruption and why is this relevant. This is an attractive term that if you read all the popular press, everything is disrupting. Uh, every company disrupts and everyone is disrupted. But what I'm going to talk more in detail is about organizational responses, especially at an established firm. So not at a small firm, innovative firm, but more big firms that have some kind of legacy uh, and they are dealing with disruptive changes. Now, a couple of things again, uh, which we all academics are familiar with, but those of you who are not, maybe a little bit less. I think that if, you, if we as an academic try to investigate uh, those organizational responses, we actually face some interesting challenges. So usually the data is not really readily available. You know, it's not really that there is some kind of database we can just go into and crunch the data. So there, sometimes they are, but very often they are not. Uh, 
Uh, the other thing which is even more interesting uh, in our world is that those people that do have this data or they can show us what they are doing, they don't really want to share this with us. Not necessary because that's extremely sensitive commercially, but companies very rarely talk about how they organize themselves. So if we would invite five corporate speakers and tell them talk about innovation management, what they would do, more, most likely, they will tell them a little bit that they have an R&D department and they produce so many patents and they will show us some nice products or services. But if you ask them about, okay, how do you organize for this? What are the managerial challenges? They'll be kind of quiet. But partly because they don't really know why we are asking them. So because even the managers usually don't see that innovation is a management problem. Even they usually assume that this is just throwing a lot of money into R&D and mysteriously the products will come out. Uh, and the third one is that very often the data do not really exist or the, uh, at least uh, a large set of data do not exist, especially if you want to observe so emerging topics like smart cities. If you want to study smart cities, welcome. You can ask Dave how many data is available around. Kind of zero uh, in, a, in a very conventional, conventional way. Okay, so what is then disruption? Uh, again, as I said, if you read FT, then everybody is disrupted. Every good company disrupts. Every company that struggles is disrupted. But we have a little bit narrower definition about what disruption is. It means that something has to become obsolescent. obsolescent. So something doesn't matter anymore. So to make it very simple, uh, and this is what I usually say if I talk to the corporates, is that something that the company is still very good at, but it simply doesn't matter anymore. So you might still have a very good product with a high quality, but it doesn't matter. And that's a quite an interesting challenge you have. So it's not that somebody from the same, who is doing the same as you are doing, come and do a little bit better. So if somebody is coming that whatever you are doing doesn't matter anymore. And uh, this, what, when we talk about disrupt, disruption, usually it's not one company disrupted. It's the entire industry, the entire sector that is disrupted. And the one thing which is a little bit more technical, usually customers at the very beginning don't really buy into the, this new product because it's not good enough. But when it becomes good enough, they switch and disrupt the incumbent. So that's a little bit about uh, uh, the disruption. So what are the challenges? Of course, the companies, especially if they are big, the companies are usually going to look at their core business and they kind of struggle to kind of search more broadly and that's something what uh, probably Marut will talk about. There are some organizational level explanations. So the companies like humans have some routines and if these routines have to change, that's, that's never easy. Uh, so what actually makes you very good in one context might actually be a huge impediment in another one. There are some cognitive challenges, uh, cognitive inertia, so selective simplification of complex reality. And again, managers always perceive that something that has been valuable in the past is going to be valuable in the future as well. And there are some kind of cultural issues as well, uh, uh, because organizations are not monoliths. They are, they are very diverse. People have very different opinions. And I'll, that's something what I will talk a little bit more in detail. So what is actually the big question that I'm going to show some uh, work in progress research? So I didn't formulate this as a research question, but that's a quote that I read in the FT, and it was an interview with, uh, interview, uh, with Microsoft CEO, uh, who actually wrote the book about Microsoft transition. And what is here very important, he said, well, he wrote this book about Microsoft continuous transformation. So that's, that's one thing is very important. If we look about disruption and this continuous change, we usually think that this kind of happened once and then it doesn't happen for 10 years. But for these techie companies, this is much more something that they, they deal continuously. 
So that always happens. They're always disrupted or they're always potentially disrupted. And the other thing is that I put in red, he said, well, to address the challenges while in the fog of war when the questions are still unanswered. What does it mean? I think that when we do the research, we usually go and look at the companies that were successful in managing disruption, and then we go back and say, well, okay, this is why they were successful. Or all the way around, more likely, they failed. We go back and say, well, Nokia failed, let's go back. Okay, and then we point the finger at something that we believe uh, was the reason. Now, of course, that's okay from our scientific perspective, but that's not how the managers see the things. Because when they kind of manage this, they don't really know whether they are disrupted. Are they going to be disrupted? Is this technology disruptive or not? So this is what we say at the end. Yes, it was disruptive. But in the real life, when these things are outgoing, they don't necessarily, they don't necessarily know that. And of course, we will, I mean, I will tell a little bit something about initial results of the study of the companies that is now kind of potentially disruptive and try to transform themselves. And what are uh, some of the challenges? Now, the first thing that you have to know that these big established technology companies, they're dealing with this, what we, we call kind of technically kind of temporal challenges. So they have to look at the present and they have to transform while perform. So you know, they're big, they, somebody is looking at their a quarterly result all the time, so they have to be successful in the, in the present. Now, but the other thing that they all have a very proud past. They were very successful in the past. There were a lot of things that worked really well in the past that explain why they are big, why they are very successful. And they try to protect their legacy. Although this legacy is exactly what is actually challenged. And of course, this company as well, always look in the future because they are aware that their long-term relevance will always be questioned. And they are looking at the things uh, that all these technological challenges that usually affect them, they can see them as an opportunity but also as a potential disruption. So if you are a manager, you are actually managing this big temporal challenge. So uh, that's, the, that's something I'm going to skip. So if somebody shares this, but we are looking at, uh, at well, I can, I can tell the name of the company. We have a big project with, with Ericsson uh, and Ericsson is a company that is currently transforming. We don't know whether in what kind of direction they are going to transform. Uh, two of the researchers that are currently Ericsson are, are, are here. So they, they, can, they can kind of correct me if I'm wrong or support me if I'm right. Uh, now, this is not kind of exactly their research, it's something that I'm uh, doing with, 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 with the colleagues and I will just kind of reflect to the, some first uh, insights. So, uh, what we find out that in the organization like Ericsson, but that would probably, I would generalize on all these kind of big companies, uh, there are multiple, that we find coexistence of multiple distinctive strategic frames. What does it mean? It means that you know, different departments, different units on the different levels actually, put it simply, believe that they should do something else. They don't necessarily have a consensus about strategic direction. Uh, they believe that there are other capabilities important, that, there are, uh, that they should go in a different directions. Now that's probably not that surprising if you have ever been in the company, so that's always the case, although we always behave that it's not. Uh, but it is, so uh, that's something, but what is the consequence of this? Not just a kind of low consensus, I'm not trying to say that this is necessarily bad. Uh, but it's quite interesting that they interpret the same challenge very differently. So if we look at Ericsson, for example, when they got cloud computing, so you have some units that said this is disruptive, some units said, oh, this is continuous. Uh, so they all see this very differently. So that's quite interesting. Now, uh, I guess that at this stage you might say, well, that doesn't really matter. Okay, we know that the company is very, uh, very diverse, but at the end of the day, companies are hierarchies, there is somebody on the top. And the person who is the top decides where the strategic direction is. Now, that's a little bit problematic because, of course, if we look at the last 
three, four years in Ericsson, they have two CEOs. And these two CEOs have very different strategic frame. So the first CEO has what we kind of call in a, a bit of a technical language, hybrid and diverse frame. So he was temporarily focused on all three. So yeah, there was something you can see that he's talking about, well, there are some changes that are evolutionary, some changes that are destructive. We have to look in the future, in the past, and in the present. And he tried to kind of combine everything. Now, the new CEO is definitely not saying this. He basically said, well, we have to sort out ourselves in the, in the present, so we have to focus. There are very clear hierarchy about what we have to do. So again, what the strategic frame is, uh, on the CEO level, it's also not necessarily that clear. Now, what we see as an organizational response is that, you know, if you have a, a CEO with this very diverse strategic frame, the organizational design will be very fragmented. When this CEO came in, they split a lot of departments. And what you get is, is an interesting uh, situation where these different departments have a very clear, distinct strategy. Uh, and all the complexity is on the level of the CEO. Now, with the other, with the other CEO, you have uh, almost all the way around. What they did is they merged a lot of departments. So you have on the, on the top level, he kind of avoids what we call kind of uh, paradoxes or contradictions. Uh, but these paradoxes and contradictions then emerge on the, on the level of strategic groups. So you can see how organizational responses in the real life are very different. So bear in mind, I'm not now trying to say that either of this is right or wrong. But that's something what you will very often get in the organizations. You will get in the organization that will try to deal with its multiple challenges. They will try to organizational response by kind of disintegration so that different units can do different things. But on the top level, there might be some kind of tipping point achieved of complexity. They will try to resolve this to simplify the strategy, to make changes that somehow suggest that it will be easier to manage, but then these contradictions of past, present, and future actually move down on the level of the subject groups. So that's a little bit uh, an example of how we do research about something where the data is not readily available, where we kind of have to go uh, to the company, try to understand what is really going on, try to talk with different people, look for different documents to support these, these inferences. So with that, I'll, I'll stop, and I think that the question will be at the end, or? OK, great. Thank you. Thanks, Dario. So well, good afternoon, everyone. So it's great uh, to share, basically. My, my research on platforms here, and I'm ever excited basically whenever I talk about platforms. So today I will talk about basically competition in platform-based ecosystems, and specifically I will talk a bit about how the design choices in the platforms have you know performance consequences in these markets. So you know we are uh, today. I will just give a quick agenda. Sorry. So I will talk a bit intro on the platform-based ecosystems because now every very is platform as much as disruption we have. They are generally actually walking together with platforms, right? Uber, Airbnb, and so on. And then I will talk a bit about the technological leapfrogging in platform competition, and that applies mostly to technology platforms, where you have a technological core element, like an iPhone or iOS, right? Where the ecosystem, for example, of developers are based on this technology. So they are updating their, for example, apps every time any iPhone comes to the market. So I will talk a bit about these technological platforms and how the role of technology plays in competing platforms. Then I will give an example, which is my research actually, a bit a tale of two video game consoles. And then I will talk about an opposite case. And before closing, before giving my takeaways, I will also talk a bit about actually how the environmental dynamics and industry conditions actually changes how your design choices have different consequences 
using the example of the video game industry, which I have studied extensively. So, well, now we are in an era of platform. You open everywhere, you open any newspaper, anything, any news about regulation of Amazon or Google to everyday use of Uber we have, Alibaba, Facebook, everything is a platform more or less. And now it's getting even more pervasive because now we have the AI, uh, for example, which are providing even an infrastructure to many of these technologies that such that the platforms are now not only an issue of social media, you know, apps, but they are also a part of now the heavy industry, like the big companies like GE and Siemens are actually transforming themselves to become a platform ecosystem based company. So how do they work? So the platform comes, actually the platform idea mostly comes from economics. And mostly, you know, very prominent economics has, has worked on this topic, including a Nobel Prize winner, Jean Tirol. And the idea is this, platforms create value by easing transaction across sides. For ease of exposition, let's say this platform has two sides. You have a seller and you have a buyer. What platform does is that, think like Alibaba, it puts you together the buyer and seller or eBay, right? The seller and buyer and eases the transaction between them. So it matches them and it creates value as such. So, and why platforms are so pervasive is that because of two things we talk about in economics. One is called direct network effects and the other is indirect network effects. Direct network effects simply means that the value of a product you use increases with the number of other users. The easiest example is WhatsApp. If you have many friends on WhatsApp, WhatsApp have a, has a big value for you, but if you are not using WhatsApp, for example, in China, there are different apps used, then you have very little value. So this is what we call direct network effects. And indirect network effects is when you have network effects across the sides. Think about a video game console. The more users play PlayStation, the more game developers would like to put their games on PlayStation and vice versa. The more games that are on PlayStation, I am more likely to buy a PlayStation because I know there are more choices. And because of these two kinds of network effects, platforms show uh, immense growth such that they become very pervasive. And that's the reason, for example, why Uber and Airbnb are able to challenge established industries of taxi or hotel industry so quickly because the value for users, buyers and sellers increase so fast. So, yet we talk about the, in an economic way about platforms, but not all platforms actually are significant in terms of economics, but they're also mostly technological architectures. So the platform actually as a term, <coughs> before economics people have used it, it comes from engineering design. The platforms as a term has been used in automotive industry, right? So you have this platform of a car, which is the chassis, kind of, and then you can build different models on top of that. So the platforms, from an engineering point of view actually, are core stable architectures where you can add modules and customize things. So it is actually a, a device, a means to innovate by using these platforms. And that's what iOS is, if you think, because the app developers on Apple use iOS to develop their apps, and Apple provides them the right toolkit to do that. So platforms are both economic, basically, tools in a way structures, which eases transaction and create value as such, but they also create value as becoming core technological architectures to create innovations, complementary innovations on them. So that was a quick primer on platforms. And when we think about the technology, we actually think that the technological leapfrogging plays a big role when platforms compete. So I will give examples from the industry I studied, the video game industry, the video game consoles. And what happens is that basically, if I have a PlayStation 1 and my competitors would like to beat me in the market, what they would do is that they will introduce any platform that has more functionality than PlayStation 1, right? So they will introduce the Hakan console 2, which is two times faster than PlayStation 1. And they will try to woo users and game developers saying that, look, I have this new technology, you can develop better games on it, and users, you will have this latest technology which can play Blu-ray and whatever and HD graphics. So by this way, basically, you are trying to, you know, surpass your competitors in the market. And what happens is that I will tell a tale of two competing consoles in such a competition. 
So the year is 2005, a new generation of video game console competition is beginning, and there are basically three contenders, but I will focus on two, which on one hand you have Xbox 360 from Microsoft, which is trying to challenge the market the PlayStation 2 has dominated, and you have a latecomer, PlayStation 3, that joins the market one year later, you know, to replace the PlayStation 2, and to basically get the dominance of the market once again. So what happens is that the Xbox comes to the market a year earlier and PlayStation has to be delayed because it goes through an extensive R&D. So the R&D work on PlayStation 3 has been together with IBM and Sharp and it started in 2002 in a processor technology called Cell. And the idea is that we will, they will come with such a dramatic change in the processor technology, you know, no one can challenge anymore PlayStation because it will be so much better. In a way, yes, PlayStation 3 comes to the market and its CPU technology is actually well advanced compared to its competitor, mostly the Xbox, because V is already a different beast. Yet, what happens is that it's not so much actually superior when independent game developers, right, the people who works on, let's say, electronic arts or whatever, see this device because now they need to develop games for it and they, now they realize that, oh, this device is very complex because it has actually eight core uh, processor compared to three cores of Xbox and seven of these cores are specialized CPU cores which require a special language to utilize them. So they need to now learn a whole set of programming instructions to utilize them to their best uh, potential. And what happens is that most of these developers say that, well, you know what? We won't bother with this, so we will just develop games for Xbox and then somehow modify them until it is good enough to run in PlayStation 3. So therefore, basically, this technology is not as superior as it has been claimed in the first place. And what we did in our research, we simply ask, basically, we know a bit qualitative evidence on this, so what we do is that we ask, actually, in our research, does platform architecture impact the innovation performance of multi-homing complements. So I will explain what we say in this question. So we are looking what we call the platform architecture, basically the modules and the core infrastructure that makes up a technological platform. And in our case of video game consoles, this is CPU, GPU, and RAM, the core parts of basically platforms, which you need to code your game to utilize. And we are interested in actually what we call multi-homing Complements. Multi-homing complements are games, and those games that are developed for multiple platforms at the same time. Most of the games in the market now you see, they are developed for PlayStation and Xbox, but they are actually essentially the same game. So the developer codes, you know, modifies the game to work on each of these individual platforms. And what we are trying to see here is that we wanted to see actually if the games that are on the allegedly superior PlayStation 3 actually performed worse compared to the more basic but inferior technology of Xbox. And we use actually a, a big data set of all games released between 1999 to 2010, and we are looking at the games that are exactly the same otherwise across this platform. So it is FIFA 2005 on PlayStation and FIFA 2005 on Xbox. And we are kind of looking at the review scores of these games, which are quite a good indicator how they perform within these individual platforms. And what did we find is that, well, first we find that the platform architecture does matter. But, you know, what is surprising about that? We would expect these things should differ. But more interesting is that we really find that those platforms that are more complex, although they may have been technically superior, receive lower scores in terms of the review, in terms of the quality of these games, compared to more simpler platforms. So what happens here is that, simply to translate, the PlayStation 3, although it was superior from a technical standpoint, since programmers were not ready to utilize this technology, actually a simpler technology beat it in the market, even in terms of the complements, the games developed for it, because programmers were much more ready to utilize that technology rather than this new, untested thing. So the result was this. This is an example from an award-winning game at the time called Skyrim. And there were some review quotes I put, but now I take them back. 
And basically what happens is that even if you normalize by the installed base of this platform, because Xbox was more, you know, more popular, even if I basically balance this out, I can see that the same game makes much less number of sales in terms of absolute numbers on PlayStation 3. Because when this game was released, actually there was a big bug in the game and it was deleting your progress randomly. And the reason was, again, since the PlayStation 3 was so complex, the programmers did everything. You know, the game was even not running well, but the game was so crippledly bugged that it was deleting your progress. And this was because all because of the complexity of this platform. So you can see how much it affects the outcomes for even independent people who are working on your platform and, you know, providing apps or games. That said, this is not always the case. The complexity is not always bad. And... An opposite case comes, again, from PlayStation, but that is from PlayStation 2. In terms of PlayStation 2, we have, again, actually a complex design, but that platform was the most successful device ever until the Wii came to the market, and it sold more than 110 million units. It, so it dominated the market. And this seems a paradox, right? Because we claim something and we find something else here. Yet what we find here is that actually the multi-homing games, so those games that are released on multiple platforms, still perform worse on this platform because the idea is, again, if you need to develop your game on multiple consoles, what a, an independent developer does is that it just thinks that, well, I won't make a specialized investment to work on this technology. Instead, I will use a common denominator approach. So I will have this one game that works equally well on everything. And in this case, basically simpler technologies are easier to work first because they are simpler to work and then you just port, modify the game to more complex technology, which kind of works. Eh. Yet the complexity benefits actually, and this is the case of PlayStation 2, when you have people that would like to specialize on your technology. Because in this case, people are not able to actually imitate the special link between these games and the platform because they are so intricately connected to take advantage of these specialized technical architectures. So what happens is that basically in the market we see that PlayStation 2 succeeded because in its era the games were generally produced for a single platform, what we call an exclusive game. On the other hand, when we go to the 2005 onwards, the game production costs has increased so much which you can see through the average project size, so the number of people that needed to work to develop a game, the game economics, the game production economics, pushed firms to develop their games on multiple platforms. And when you want to develop for multiple <coughs> platforms, we see that actually the complex platforms suffer, and that's the reason Sony has actually lost quite a market share and had to actually fire its CEO that developed this and designed this platform, and now we can see all the platforms in the market are copying it very simple architectures because of the economics of the game development require everyone to multi-home. So nobody spends extra time specialized on the architecture of these complex platforms. So there are some takeaways, but if I am over time, so I will just say my biggest takeaway. So the point is that, I think the biggest takeaway is that we are moving to these platforms and there is this huge talk about platforms. But one big thing I think firms should keep in mind is that managing platforms their ecosystems are quite different than products. If this platform would have been a product, the more superior product you release to pro market, you would expect to be more successful, but that's not the case in terms of a platform because now you have an ecosystem of independent but interdependent actors that you also need to manage. So if you act yourself and think that one gizmo and wonder device is so good, it may not give the result you need because you are now you know, required to work together with these all interdependent actors to create value. Thank you very much. This is uh, some work uh, I've been doing. Uh, it's a work in progress. And uh, it's basically uh, trying to answer, a, as Krista pointed out earlier, one of the challenges that the firm has in terms of creating innovation and uh, the organizational challenge. So the challenges are not only technological, but organizational too. So this is uh, about organizing the innovative activity, innovative R&D activity within a, a firm. And uh, 
So if you are a, uh, a chief technological officer or even a chief e executive officer in a company or whoever who organizes innovation process, you have uh, some important decisions to make uh, in terms of regional location of the innovation activity. On the one hand, you can concentrate all the R&D activity in one region. Okay? That in, in that way, you have a lot of people uh, in a lot of technologies working in the same location. Managing them, organizing them is a lot easier. But uh, the, the downside of that approach is that knowledge is, uh, is uh, dispersed throughout regions. Even if you think about one country, there are different pockets of knowledge across the different regions. And if you want to make use of those pockets of knowledge, uh, the alternative strategy should be to diversify the location of your R&D activity. So that's what we mean by uh, distant search, distant knowledge search. So searching knowledge in distant locations. And uh, so previous studies mostly focused on cross-country organization. Uh, but if, if you look at, the, at, um, at many innovation active countries, even within countries, there is a lot of diversity in terms of innovative activity across regions, within country, but across regions. So here, I am looking at the regional factors influencing the innovative outcomes. Okay? Now, innovative outcomes, there are two sides to it. The, in the previous, uh, in the in the academic research, mainly the focus is on innovation quality, or in other words, how impactful the innovation is. Okay, because there is there may be a lot of patents patents that firms develop, however, they never get used. Okay, so and, and there is usually a very small proportion of patents that create a lot of value for firms. Right, so the focus is not to look at innovation output as as output of patents, but as, 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 an in, as an output of high quality innovation or high quality patents. Now, uh, the, the two aspects I'm looking at are is that how this uh, dispersion or uh, geographical distribution of R&D activity influencing, is influencing innovative outcomes, and also how the, the quality of institutions in that location, in the home location, is influencing the innovative outcomes. And I have two in different innovative outcomes. One is innovation quality, which is a technical measure, technical quality of the innovation. However, the, another aspect that, that uh, usually drops from the attention is the financial outcomes. Because you may disperse the infor innovation process a lot throughout the country or across countries, but this strategy doesn't come free, right? So. W there are two challenges. One challenge is to translate high quality innovation into profits, because that's the, the, the ultimate purpose of economic activity, right? of the co commercial activity. Uh, and there, are, there is the cost aspect of it. Right? it, it doesn't, the, this distribution doesn't come free, so there are costs. So uh, I look at the technical performance in terms of quality of those patents and also at the commercial performance in terms of profitability. So, uh, yeah, this is based, the analysis is based on, uh, the, on the 351,000 patents that, that belong to 10,000 uh, innovation active firms in uh, 237 subnational regions in 19 European Union countries. So innovation active firms are those that produce patents. Uh, so there is some theoretical background, but uh, I'll, I'll skip this one because of the time concerns. The definitions are mainly that the institutional quali quality, uh, uh, innovation quality it measures the technological impact of a new idea or innovation. Empirically, we measure that as the count of citations. So the more the patent, a patent uh, uh, was cited, the higher its impact is. Or in other words, it, it prompted other innovation. So that's, that, that's how we measure the quality of innovation. And distant knowledge search, we, have, uh, we create an index to measure the dispersity of innovative activity, not only the location, but the proportion of the innovative work within a firm uh, taking, part, taking place in different locations. 
and institutional quality. Institutions are usually uh, defined as the rules of the game uh, in the market. So here the institutional quality stands for the company's ability to make use of that knowledge or to make use of the innovation to, uh, to generate outcome. Right? It may be technical outcome because you know, if the institutions are good, it's easier to collaborate with others. Uh, you can easily protect your intellectual property, which means uh, you can generate more money. So there are five hypotheses. Don't try to read them. <laughs> They're too small. I, I, I tried to put all of them in one slide, and uh, I skipped the part where I developed the hypothesis. But I've put the results in a, in a lot simpler way, where you will see uh, the, uh, the, the uh, hypothesis together with the results. And uh, this is the methodology. Another part I wouldn't want to go to <laughs> into much detail. But uh, basically, it's the OECD patent database. Uh, I, I al already mentioned the, the uh, patents. And uh, the institutions are measured at regional level. And uh, the dependent variables are quality of innovation as the counts of citations and the return on sale. By the way, by dependent and independent variables, by saying dependent and independent variables, I'm referring to regression analysis. Right? Uh, yeah. So, this is a distribution of firms, of 10,000 firms. <coughs> These are 10,000 firms throughout uh, eight years. So, I have 31,000 observations, unbalanced, because not every firm created patents in every year. So, it's 31,000 observations for econometric analysis. And uh, here, is the here are the results of the analysis. So if you do econometrics, you can look at the table as well. But if you don't, I've put the, the graph, which is easier to understand. So the first hypothesis is basically uh, expect that the relationship between geographic distribution and innovation quality is curvilinear. So it's positive on the in the first stage, in the beginning. This is the geographic distribution. So as you start distributing uh, the innovative activity, you are gaining new, you, you are tapping into to different pockets of knowledge. So that actually increases the quality of your innovation. You can see that uh, the, the average number of citations can go up from 21 up to 27 just by this strategy alone. Okay? And uh, however, there is some point which is an inflection point after which uh, if you get too much geographically <coughs> diversified, it gets too difficult to manage the excessively diversified innovative process. So the quality is actually slight, starting to decline a little. So that's the first hypothesis. And the second hypothesis, what about the impact of institutions in the home region? So once you bring in knowledge, okay, um, that's good, but are you uh, that does the does the regional quality quality uh, sorry institutional quality within the region help the innovation quality? And here is the result. So, in uh, low quality institutional environments uh, and high quality institutional environments, the difference in terms of quality can range from around 13 up to 35 uh, citations per per per, per firm on average. So. And then I also looked at, so th this is the direct effect of institutional quality on, on the quality of patents. And here is the impact of institutions on the way the firms create quality from uh, geographical distribution strategy. Okay? In other words, the three lines show uh, the average numbers of citations for low quality institutions medium quality institutions and high quality institutions. Okay, so it's not just the direct effect of institutions that's important, but also the moderating effect, or in other words, uh, it's not equally, the, the geographic distribution strategy is not equally good for all firms located in all regions. You also have to think about the institutional quality of your home location so that you can actually create value from that uh, imported knowledge, okay? Now, 
If you look at the other aspect of performance, however, which is profitability, the relationship is actually upside down. In the beginning, okay, you start to geographically diversify, okay? So the average profitability is actually declining. So it may go from three and a half percent, from nearly four percent down to one percent on average, okay? Because of just because of the geographic diversification strategy, okay. However, as you diversify, uh, you know the the initial costs may be high, but the cost of every next move, every next expansion, or every next geographic distribution will be declining, or marginal cost might be will be declining, and you know you start getting profits. So as you can see, the, other, the, the impact on innovation quality or the technical quality had inverse U-shaped relationship. And this one, the impact on commercial performance, is the other way around. So if you are a chief, economic of, uh, chief uh, executive officer, it's not a good idea to leave all the decisions to your chief technological officer alone because he will be interested in the technological performance mainly or in the quality of the patents, not, uh, not necessarily on the overall you know, cost and benefit aspect of it. And the same interaction effect with institutions. Here you can see that the, that, uh, the effect is the other way around. Now, in low quality institutions, the profitability is actually higher. Okay, why does that happen? Because institutional quality, on the, the, the obvious, the, the first expectation is that when the institutions are high quality, it, it's easier to make money. However, the problem with that logic is uh, that you know, those institutions are good for everyone. So in, in academic, in, in, uh, in resource terms, you know, it's not, uh, it doesn't give competitive advantage to anyone. It provides competitive parity to everyone, okay? which increases the level of competition for resources or for knowledge or for engineers, R&D engineers in those locations. As a result, they actually, you know, because of this high competition, the, the overall cost actually is the other way around. So, the conclusions, uh, there are some theoretical implications, but mainly the managerial implications is, implication is that the perceived benefits of geographic distribution of R&D, uh, of dispersion of R&D, should be weighed against the commercial costs as well. Otherwise, you know, the firm might end up having a net loss from all this effort of uh, innovative activity. That's all from me. Thank you. I, I wanted today just to sort of talk to you a little bit about um, design thinking, uh, and and essentially because it's 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 a core part of the kind of research I'm doing, especially uh, as, as we go on. But um, and really to talk to you, you a little bit about design thinking in theory and design thinking in practice, because uh, how many people here have heard of design thinking? So, yeah, so not that many. It's quite incredible, because um, it is, uh, in, in terms of its adoption within industry now, it's, it's, it's at an extremely fast pace. Um, and it means lots of different things to different people. Um, some of the perceptions around design thinking are correct. Some are uh, a, a bit, uh, you know, incorrect or, or delusional. So I'm going to sort of try and give you a little bit of uh, an understanding of what we mean by design thinking. Um, and some of this sort of comes to the, a special issue of California Management Review on, on editing. Um, so, so it kind of captures some of the elements of that special issue, uh, which a lot of my colleagues who we're also working on papers together with uh, are working on different elements of this question. So, um, David Held at uh, LSC um, and his colleagues uh, talk, talked a while about, about uh, we're at the time of the Hydra headed crisis. So, imagine, so here you have Hydra with, uh, you know, all these evil heads and you have Hercules here um, and, and essentially uh, Hercules is battling these, this Hydra headed crisis and that's where we are today. We are at a, a time, a juncture in our, in our, uh, uh, in our world and in, in, in our, our lives today where we're actually battling so many different things of significant, significant uh, challenge. And, and, and so uh, the question is how are we going to do that? 
How are we going to address all these things that are going on? For example, uh, in terms of the political uh, instability that's happening, the, the, the sort of the the the, the uh, bifurcation of, of, of political ideologies, uh, which are really having a significant impact on the world. Look at Brexit, for example, in terms of the impact. And we heard today by a few of the speakers in terms of how profound some of the impacts of Brexit are going to be and just how badly prepared we are for it. And they're literally making it up as they go. Um, we have all these challenges in terms of, in terms of um, uh, you know, the, the nuclear threat is increasingly becoming uh, real, uh, uh, you know, and... and, uh, and uh, I, I don't think people understand how close we've been to sort of nuclear arc Armageddon a few times uh, in, in recent history. Um, there's also a crisis of society. So we have a crisis of ecology, a crisis of economy, and a crisis of society. And so aspects of society are breaking down, and you're seeing that in terms of people want a voice. Um, and so they thought voice would come through Twitter, but really we're still seeing uh, nothing much is changing for people in terms of inequalities, in terms of gender inequalities, in terms of racial and, 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 and other uh, uh, areas of inequality. So these challenges are, are, are here, uh, serious, and, and, and there's big challenges for us to actually deal with them. <coughs> the other aspect of it is this, uh, the, the, but in terms of the fourth revolution, and this is, this, is the, this is the biggest disruptor in terms of our future. And really, um, uh, this is really going to have profound effect on all of you, uh, all of us, in terms of what we teach, in terms of what kinds of jobs we have, in terms of how our lives continue uh, 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 basically for eternity now. So we have Watson, for example, who, you know, so, so, so there's not a machine, there's, there's not a human that can beat Watson at, at say, Jeopardy. And, and, and so, so, so what you're seeing now is deep learning, cognitive computing, these sorts of things, again, which are going to have profound effects in terms of how we collect information. So the stuff that we've been collecting here around sort of search depth and search breadth, the comp this will do it much easier than any academic can ever do it, okay? And so they won't even need us. Um, in terms of how we make medical decision making, in terms of how we make a range of deci decision making, there's, there's small outfits now, three person businesses that now produce uh, decision making tools that which you can make a thousand decisions per second. What would it have been like to be this person in, 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 at, at the time of the, uh, of, of the uh, wall market crash? If you imagine, and let's look at the impact of technology. Now, forget what this guy has done, um, which is quite horrific. Let's just take into consideration uh, what this man has done, because um, he received a letter from the uh, International Olympic Committee saying he cannot compete in the Olympics. <coughs> you know why he couldn't compete in the Olympics? It's too fast. Okay, so technology transforms. Okay. So there's a there's there's there's, there's a element of technology which is going to actually totally transform humanity and humans. It's already happening. Okay. But there are a number of challenges around that. So the key question there is, um, how are we going to ensure technology has a maximum benefit, the optimization of, of technology on beneficiaries? Okay, so it's kind of an ideological question. How are we going to ensure the future technology enhances humanity Right? not destroys it. So you've all heard the singularity argument? No? Okay, so singularity is that eventually uh, computers will take over the world and destroy us. Yeah? Um, which is kind of true. That there are kill bots being developed. There is a range of, of technology being developed around this, uh, which, which, again, have a number of, uh, you know, any endless possibility of, 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 of Skynet happening, right? Um, so what do we have? Well, we have these things called wicked problems, horse ritual, uh, you know, back in the, in the 60s, uh, talked about these really complex problems that are very confusing. They, they involve multiple stakeholders. Uh, you know, it, it has a, a, they, they are systemic problems. You can't change one thing without affecting the other thing. And also, the solution is often as confusing as, and as uncertain as, as the problem itself. And these are the things we're left with. This is what we have today. And this is what universities need to be working with in collaboration with 
uh, government, in collaboration with industry, in collaboration with community organisations. So collaboration is becoming a really, really important uh, aspect of the future. And that's my area of work, is collaboration, complex collaboration. So I trust in humans. Uh, I believe in humans. Uh, we, we explore beyond our own limits. We will take risks to experience the world and life, and risk-taking is critical to, to human uh, functioning. We will risk our lives for other species. There's not many other animals that do this. All right, he's not risking too much. He's pretty well protected. But um, We will even risk our lives for other people's iPads and TVs and, and so on. We will uh, think we can control nature. Right? But we can't control nature. There's no way. We will uh, give up everything for a cause. And there'll be institutions that try to make us all the same, standardise us, routinise us. Okay? And so we'll spend eternity trying to be different. So there's an element of being human which is quite wondrous. And that's the bit that I'm backing. It's the curiosity, the creativity, the ingenuity, the passion of the human. Right? So when we bring humans together with technology to enhance human capabilities and capacities, we get into really interesting spaces. So, um, so my background is in psychology and, and sort of starting to bring this back into my work and I'm really thinking about sort of, uh, you know, how does the brain affect, for example, things like uh, collaborative innovation? Right? So the... the, the, the the brain has a profound effect on creativity, on our ability to be creativity and how we're creative. And we often take for granted that our creativity is bounded by what we know. I'll give you an example. Um, what I want you to do is to just to do this little experiment, okay? So my PhD students, and I think a couple of guys here have done this with me before, but I just want you to do this with me now. Uh, so I want you to pick a number between 1 and 10, okay? Got it? And I want you to multiply that number by 9. Then I want you to add the two digits that you've got left. So if you if if you if you got ninety, do nine plus zero equals nine. Yeah, got that. So and then I want you to minus five from that digit. So you're left with one digit. Then what I want you to do is I want you to take that number that you've got. So if you've got one, I want you to translate it to an A, two a B, three a C, in the corresponding alphabet. Yeah. Done that. Now I want you to think of a country that starts with that letter. Yeah? Now I want you to take the second letter of that country and think of an animal. You got the animal? And the colour of that animal? And probably most of you will have that. Okay? So what happens there is, is, uh, is a whole range of networks going on, neural networks that are going on, in terms of how your brain stores information, uh, where it stores it, and then how you access it. Right? And so we can control the, the, the amount of data that we give you, the kinds of questions we give you, and we can, we can elicit those parts of the brain for you to respond. Right? Now this happens whenever you make a decision. So when you make a decision, you've already made your decision before you even know it. And it's using that stock of knowledge you have. So if we keep on working with the same people to innovate, what we find is that inverse relationship, eventually you become less and less creative because you're using what you know each time you try to create. Okay? Which means diversity and, and diversity of experience and the involvement of people uh, across sort of uh, different subject areas uh, is really important. And that's one of the essence of, of, of design thinking. Forget these slides here, but I want you to think about how we structure organisations. Even ones that we think are quite innovative, I want you to think about some of the ways we structure organisations. So, so, so a while ago, you might have heard of uh, Frederick Taylor, was this, this idea of the scientific management. Okay? And part of his ideas was that management is a science. Okay? So there's one best way of managing. And he brought into the vernacular a lot of words from science. Right? So there's a science to, to managing, and, uh, and this, this language around that, 
two minutes? Yep. This language around that has become kind of uh, commonplace. So if you think about in terms of one of the ideas of science is the separation of mind over matter. All right? So the experimenter works on the experiment. Yeah? So in the mind, we have the head. And in the matter, we have the body. Uh, in the head, we have the brain, the eyes, and senses. Right? In the body, we have the arms and legs, the reproductive organs. And the language you use today in organisations are derivative of those, headquarters, head office, supervision, to have superior vision over, uh, versus hired hands, labour, subordinates, materials. Where are the human resources? On the left, next to the pencils. Right? So, so it's no coincidence. Okay? This, is, this is how, over time, we've taken for granted this kind of top-down leader in the head office, with the head and the brain, workers in the bottom who produce the labour. Okay? And this is taken for granted today. And when we talk about empowerment and creativity and enabling people, this has become, uh, you know, uh, in, in some of the organisations I've seen, quite disingenuous because, because they're still putting all those control mechanisms in place. So what I want to sort of close with is this idea of, of, of design thinking as, as a method uh, and a process for innovation. So if you, there's, there's a whole range of organisations you can go and look at now. For example, you can go to IBM and they've got a whole design thinking arm. You can go to Arabs, they have a design thinking arm. They've got to, so you can think of any kind of organisation, uh, Siemens uh, a, a, and so on. NASA now works in, in design thinking. And it's kind of a, uh, a, a way of actually addressing many of the issues that I've been talking about in terms of the collaboration of bringing multiple creativity into, 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 the, into the process. So uh, especially this idea of empathy. So empathy is a really core process in part of, of the design thinking process, really important. And by empathy we mean actually really engaging with the beneficiaries or the users. Okay? So the user-centred approach becomes really critical. Uh, the other really important part is the extreme user, and I'll, I'll finish with this slide, uh, with extreme user. And the extreme user is, in engineering, often the extreme user means um, the, multi the, the, the maximum amount of users. That's not what we mean by extreme user in design thinking. What we mean is the, uh, the most difficult user. So when we design, we design for the most difficult user, and that, what that does is it gets you to understand the constraints that you're facing and helps you design better, uh, and then that can translate, for example, to a, a larger number of users. Okay. Um, I'll leave that because I think I, I spent a bit too much time on the first bit, but, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions afterwards on design thinking. But that's why I'm sort of really moving into this world of uh, design thinking, studying, uh, essentially, um, what's the psychology of design thinking? And how does that impact innovation in the workplace? How can you create innovation by, through the use of design thinking? And does that improve the impact of the technology that we're inventing, particularly in terms of the pointy end technology, like some of the stuff which I was showing you before? Okay, so, so I'll stop there, because I've gone a bit over. <laughs> so what I want you to do now is just to, just to reflect for a minute in terms of the, the three presentations. Oh, you can ask questions on mine as well. Um, but, but, um, and then just uh, shoot some questions out. Thank you. Hello. Um, I work at the Business Confucius Institute, so I was watching what you're saying, thinking about how it might relate to China. Um, so particularly the um, looking at the R&D activity within a firm and your studies on that, I think it, that was based on EU firms, right? Yes. And I was just wondering how, if you have any thoughts, so you can speculate on how those hypotheses would apply to China. Because... Um, We've got an event next week with George Yip, and he's done a lot of talking about how firms in China innovate and how, that, and how people should take advantage of it. And some of what he was saying was that part of what makes it a great place to innovate is that it's a completely unique environment. And I just, I'm not sure how familiar you are with all those thoughts about China, but whether you have any ideas about what, how yours might apply in that environment. Yeah. 
Thank you. A very good question. You're actually tapping into the work we are actually doing, okay. uh, but we haven't got the data collected yet. But we have people in China, our collaborators in China, collecting similar data set. So uh, we are thinking of making a comparative study between the EU countries and, uh, uh, well, we are saying emerging countries, but it's mainly China. Because if you look at the patent trends, uh, China is the outlier in Asia anyway. Uh, well, in the emerging Asia. Of course, Japan, Korea have traditionally been very innovative, but China is a newcomer and it's a very interesting place to study. Now, it, when it comes to researching the impact of the diversification uh, strategy or the impact of institutional quality, uh, theoretically, from the theoretical point of view, uh, the impact could actually be that the, in, uh, the reverse of what we expect here because the way innovation works in China is actually very different. So, in other words, the innovation is not, uh, the, the way you make money from innovation is not in terms of prote protecting your property rights. It's more uh, of, uh, based on, on uh, utilizing existing knowledge. So rather than creating something radically new, you take out existing knowledge, synthesize them, and apply it in the market to generate rents. So that's the general expectation. But of course, we cannot tell the results before we do the research. But you know, the general idea, the exciting bit is there. And we are working on that. And uh, yeah, we, we have people, you know, well, Henrik is in our division. And yeah, we do research in this area, and yeah, we will share the results once we have them. <laughs> I have a question for Kirsto and Hake. Uh, I was thinking whether, uh, do you, I, I speak. <laughs> okay, so I have a question for Kirsto and Haken. I was I was questioning whether what is your position on the following sentence whether are platforms disruptive or not, for whom or under which conditions? For whom? For whom? Like, uh, there are industries where, the, where, where they were more or less disruptive? Yes. If they well, are not disruptive at all? Well, I think that, uh, you know, not, not every disruption is necessarily a platform. So, yeah. you know, if, if you look at a more kind of old-fashioned case of company being disrupted, it's usually Kodak. So they weren't disrupted by a platform as such. But now, I mean, if we look at uh, the platform disruptors, uh, I think that they are kind of characteristic for kind of digital technologies with this asset light business model. And they are a little bit unique case because the conventional disruptive innovation theory is that disruptive technology kind of goes to the particular niche market and needs a lot of time to develop. And then suddenly when it's good enough, the core market switch. So that's the, that's the conventional theory around disruption. Now, a lot of these platforms that uh, Haken used at the very beginning, let's say like Airbnb, uh, you know, Facebook and Uber and so on, they are not going into the niche market first. They actually go to the core market immediately and disruptions happen very quickly. So that's something where the, the platform disruptions are somehow a little bit different to what was broadly understood as a, as a disruptive innovation. Now, who is kind of disrupted? Uh, well, obviously, as I said, well, the, the, the industries whose kind of capabilities and resources become kind of obsolete uh, because, of, because of kind of this digital disruption. For example, if you look at Airbnb, you obviously don't need to own the hotel anymore. So the, the kind of the, the value of the hotel therefore decreases. Uh, but I think that of course it's very difficult to not generalize which industry is going to be disrupted in advance. So I mean, I'm excited, so I can talk about more platforms now. <laughs> 
I mean, I would say, I mean, actually, Christo has laid out quite broadly in a way, which is correct. I mean, if I look a bit more on the patterns, maybe, one idea could be those industries that are inefficient because you have like a monopoly structure, maybe, like the taxis, right? Tax licensing is expensive. It is an official process and they have a whole that kind of a monopoly. So that's the part, for example, where Uber has created the value and it is a transaction in a way. And on the other hand, if I think hotels again, in the hotels case, the issue is again, right, the hotel investment is very expensive. You need to have this huge fixed cost so that the Hilton can open a new place here. But with Airbnb, it can just go pop up multiple times because now you are demoting basically this big organization to a single individual that just agrees to the terms on Airbnb. And you as a looker say, okay, I will agree to the terms of Airbnb instead of a hotel. And, you know, we will match each other. So, in a way, I would say that what is the big thing is that I think these big kind of structures, either in a way because of regulation with taxes or because of the companies with hotels, are now kind of demoted and getting more easy to, you know, match between each other. And that's what the platform really allows this disruptiveness to some extent but on the other hand there is you have the challenge of governance now right with airbnb and uber you like to agree because you look at the reviews and you say okay i agree to that but then if you look at the airbnb hell.com you will read crazy stories what people have have seen so for platforms now the challenge is that once it becomes more autonomous in a way not autonomous because platform owner right takes the commission and arranges the matching but it becomes much more fast in that way but now we have the challenge of governance you know, people will come up and say, hey, I bought this. It's a fake item from Alibaba. What will happen now? And that was a big story, part of the Alibaba's history, actually. So, yeah. But I would just add to this very quickly. So don't forget, for example, what motivated Clayton Christensen with his disruptive innovation. Basically, he was interested why the firms that are managed well, why they fail. So this is something what he started. So he started, he looked at the firms that are they're well managed. So it's not that there is a kind of a management reason that they were, you know, this kind of explained uh, the, the failure. So this is how he kind of studied and this is the, the kind of innovator dilemma. So it's not that the managers are doing something which is obviously wrong. So that's very important with, uh, with the disruptive uh, dynamics. So if you are disrupted, then you have a serious problem. Uh, so the, the, the quick fix is, is not going to help. I think also the, the, the term disruption I think is overused. I mean, the stuff that I'm seeing, uh, for example, people, you know, uh, technology is trying to upload consciousness. That's disruptive. Yeah? It's destructive, maybe. Yeah, destructive, <laughs> yeah. To me, Uber is not disruptive. Right? Uh, you know, it's just another way to travel. To me, if a transport company invents a way that we don't need to travel, that's disruptive. Yeah. So, 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 so we use words like innovation and disruption, you know, quite haphazardly. I think. I agree on that one. In a way, basically. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, okay. So, yeah, <laughs> my name is Bintan uh, Tirisari. I'm, I'm a PhD student from the School of Design, so I'm probably uh, from different area. But it's, it was very good uh, presentation. Um, I enjoy. But what I want to ask, I want to ask to Professor Tiron. Sorry if I yes, spelled okay. it wrong. Yeah, because the, uh, in, the, in, in your first slide, you mentioned about uh, design thinking. And yeah. I'm quite familiar with that. And you mentioned like uh, the reality in the fourth revolution and then the different, uh, uh, mentioned about was the dissenting in theory and the practice. My question is uh, first, uh, what actually the difference between like, uh, maybe you can, because I think you don't have time before to explain. 
and maybe what is dark horse because I think like yeah. also like uh, a term that I'm yeah. not familiar with. You should you, you should never air your dirty laundry. But I, I didn't realize I put up the wrong slides. So uh, halfway, <laughs> I was doing a different presentation. So so but, but so I didn't get to do the design thinking bit enough. But but the dark horse is essentially so so you will have this has come from uh, basically Larry Leifer and Martin Stoner. Uh, from Stanford and from NTNU in Norway. So the, so the dark horse is um, an interesting concept because what it is, you go through the entire ideation process and innovation process, you come up with a, a uh, uh, through multiple prototyping, you come up with, with a product or a service or, or whatever. Okay? And then what they say is you do is you then throw that away and think of another one. And that's the dark horse. So the dark horse is the horse that wins that no one picked. Yeah. So, so because one of the beauties of design thinking is it's cheap to fail, because a lot of the a lot of the process of prototyping is you're using just the junk around in your organisation. You know? So you know it might be machinery, it might be you know stuff that you've thrown out, um, and you just keep multi you, you just keep doing multiple prototypes. So so you can do this prototyping process fail, 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 fail. So so it's designed for failure. Yeah, to get to the point where you think we are at a point now that we can actually do a real prototype. Um, and so the dark horse is you get to that point, but then you think of something completely different, and that's for and that's how you get disruption. Yeah. Yeah. So and also like uh, like you mentioned like design theory, design thinking in theory and in practice. Like, uh, so there's there is a lot of work being done at the moment. For example, um, one of my co one one of my co editor editors, uh, she's been doing a lot of work around the uh, pedagogy around design thinking. Right. So is there something called, is there this thing, design thinking? And if it is, what are the sort of the core elements of it in terms of how we teach it, how we practice it? Right? And that's things we haven't answered yet, okay? because we use the term. So design thinking is this overnight success that's taken 60 years to develop. Okay? So, so there is a method to it. But the beauty of it is it's a kind of method that you take into your organisation and then what you do is you allow the unique ways that your organisation uh, does things to adopt it and adapt it. Yeah? And, and so what happens is you actually develop your own method within your own organisation. So, so if you go into IBM, they've got their own form of IBM design thinking. If you go into Siemens, they've got their own form of IBM uh, Siemens design thinking. If you go into uh, you know, any, any organisation that now has design as a core aspect of what it does, has its own form of design thinking. And when you actually look at the projects that use design thinking to develop uh, solutions, they outperform other projects. Okay, and, and part of that is because of the way it uses people, uh, it, it, the user is central to that. It's not just you ask the user what they want. In some cases, the user is working with you to produce the product. Yeah? Thank you. Yeah. Is that it? Well, thank you very much. Thank the speakers. Thank you. Thanks so much.